If you will, please open up your Bibles this morning uh, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Um, last week, I, I spoke on what it actually means to follow Christ. And we took a look at it. And uh, to follow Christ, it's no easy thing. It's not uh, a matter of just, you know, living for yourself and the things that you can get in this life. As a matter of fact, if we are going to be following Christ according to the terms that he laid down for disciples, it involves things like self-denial. It involves things like bearing a cross. It involves things like, you know, subordinating your own personal interest, you know, for self-advancement in this world for the, you know, the whole success factor and focusing primarily on his kingdom purposes. It means that you seek him first, that his will is the ruling factor of your life. And, and he warned there in that one verse, he said, you know, sometimes it may be possible that you'd think that you've lost your life in this world, but don't. He says at that point in time, that's when you really gain it unto life eternal. But, you know, some people, I, I suppose, when they think about what it actually means to follow Jesus Christ. It's a difficult thing. It can even be the path of a disciple to be an austere thing. And, and some people might find themselves wondering, is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? I mean, especially like if they were to look around and they would see others in society, neighbors nearby perhaps, that seem to be prospering and flourishing in their ways, you know, living by the policy of the world in which, you know, they don't have time for God or the things of God, but all their pursuits and all their desires are just selfishly sent on getting what they can. And so they seem to get a lot. Seems almost as if a lot is delivered into their hands. And people can look at that and they can say, wow, has the policy of self-denial, the policy of always Christ first, the policy of even bearing my cross, is it really worth it? Well, we're going to look at a passage here this morning that shows that actually it's more than worth it. We're going to look at a passage here this morning that gives us what I believe to be a sneak preview of the coming millennial kingdom. It is a sneak preview or a miniature, miniature presentation of what it's going to be like at the second advent. When our Lord Jesus Christ actually returns to this earth and he turns everything utterly upside down. And uh, so we're, I'm going to begin reading here at verse number 26, and I'm going to read down to verse number 36. He says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his fathers, and of the holy angels. So here we have, he's directing their attention to the fact that he's coming. He's going to come again. I don't know what the disciples would have gathered when they first heard that, because he was right there with them, and they were expecting anyways on their part that he was going to establish the kingdom within their own lifetimes right then. We're able to look at that now, and we see a hope for the future because he's coming back. And when he comes, what does he come with? He comes with, he says, glory, his own glory. But also, he says, the glory of the Father and a glorious cabal of angels and saints coming with him from out of heaven. And he goes on and he says, but I tell you of a truth. There 
be some standing here, which shall not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God. He says, what I just told you about me coming with glory, some of you, you, you'll see it before you die. Wow. If he'd have said that, I would be hoping in my heart, I hope I get to be one of the lucky ones then that if it's going to come and it's going to come uh, so that some of us anyways get to see it happen. I want to be amongst those who do. And then he goes on and look at what it says in verse number 28 down through 36. This will really be the passage that we're going to focus on primarily. This is called the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ. That word transfiguration, it's actually used in Mark and in Matthew. It's not actually used in Luke, but uh, it's metamorpho. And you know what metamorpho is. It's a Greek word, but we get our English word metamorphosis from it, right? And so if I were to ask you, can you give me a good example out of nature of a metamorphosis? And you might point to things like that lowly old caterpillar crawling into its cocoon there to die and be entombed. But when, in fact, it finally bursts from out of that cocoon, there has been a metamorphosis. There has been a transfiguration. It appears with a glory that is so far beyond that worm that it was that now it's, it's a, a totally new and beautiful kind of creature with abilities and liberties to fly and take flight. You know, and, and, and you think, wow, that's an amazing thing. Well, you know, Jesus Christ, when he begins to really, really, really reward his followers that have followed him despite the persecution and the hardship of this life, you know what? We too, we receive a glorification someday. There is a metamorphosis that takes place on us. And if we really get a glimpse of this and we really understand all that's entailed in being a follower of Jesus Christ, we have to pass the verdict. Oh, yes, it is more, much more than worth it to follow Jesus Christ in this lifetime. Nothing else is so worth it as living to follow him. So let's look at the passage here. It says, And it came to pass about an eight days after the saying that he took Peter and John and James and he went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory, and they spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, that Peter said unto him, Jesus Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And he did not know what he was saying. And while he thus spoke, there came a cloud that overshadowed them. This would have been the Shekinah glory, the cloud that Moses saw over the tabernacle in the wilderness, the cloud that Solomon saw over the temple and it overshadowed them and they feared as they entered into the cloud. There was a cloud that seemed to envelop all. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it closed. They didn't talk about it. They kept it secret and told no man in those days of any of those things which they had seen. So now we understand that the opening comment there, there be some of you that shall see uh, the kingdom when it comes. And 
what they were given kind of a sneak preview of is the glorified Lord Jesus Christ as he shall appear. Not when three little guys on the mountain see him. But when every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him. And when all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. When all of a sudden it's a global spectacle at the second advent. He will appear in such great and mighty glory as what they beheld him even there. But you know that brings up an interesting thing because... One of the ways in which Jesus Christ was decidedly different from all other men is that Jesus Christ did not seek his own glory. He didn't. He says, he says, I don't seek my own glory. I seek the glory of the one who sent me. I seek his glory and I don't speak for my own glory. I don't go around telling people and talking to people in order to build up a reputation for myself. I have received the commandment from my father what to say and in order to glorify him, I say just exactly that. And my whole motive, by the way, is simply to magnify him, to glorify him and to fulfill the work that he has given me to do. And if it causes that men should despise me as I fulfill his will, then so be it. I'm not in this for my glory I'm in it for his the devil one time offered him glory Jesus wouldn't have any of it he said (laughs) you're talking to the wrong guy oh but look at all the all these kingdoms all these possessions everything the glory of the whole thing it's all yours if you fall down and worship me Jesus Christ would not have any of it now men do seek glory right They, they seek it selfishly and when you when you look about the way men ordinarily are The Bible says that uh, all that is in the world, and he mentions three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and all of those things have to do with, you know, getting what you want to have, doing what you want to do, being who you want to be, and to be seen as the one who has all this glory in life. And that's, that's an ordinary path for men in this world to walk by. Jesus Christ would not... He wouldn't go for it for a minute. He had set his sights on one thing. He had a master passion and a master calling. And it was only to glorify his father. Now, he's setting an example for us. So let me just say right here at the very beginning, the master passion of our life ought to be to glorify Jesus Christ. The world may beckon to us. The world may call. The world may say, you know what? This is really where you want to go ahead and sink your uh, go after this is this is worthy of your ambition of your pursuit and we say no there's really one thing that is ultimately worthy of my ambition and my pursuit oh yeah there's a lot of needful things there's things i must have to do because i live in this world and i'm a creature of this world but all that aside i am to seek first the kingdom of god and his glory his righteousness and those other things Those secondary things, he has promised to take care of those as I put first things first. So we follow that, okay? Now, ironically, that path that we see that Jesus Christ walked to, one of spurning vainglory. Vainglory is the search for glory for yourself. That's vainglory. He spurned it. And what happens at the end of the story? We see that when he does return, he is destined for the greatest and the highest glory ever. And that, too, is instructive for us. I'm just going to make a couple of uh, points here this morning. We can be done. Um, I will be teaching. So we're going to be looking at uh, a lot of scriptures. I I want you to compare some scriptures by scriptures so you can see these ideas here this morning. But the first thing is that Christ's second coming is simply this. It is to be with great glory. Now, if you look back there where we were just reading, first of all, let's pick it up in the text itself to see where we're going with it, and then we'll go ahead and run some references on it. But if you look at verse number 26, he talks about coming with great glory, glory with his Father. And, but that, you know, that's where he declares the fact he's going to come with great glory. And if you look down there at verse 29, you actually see somewhat of the manifestation of the glory that he's talking about it says that as he prayed the fashion of his countenance was altered matter of fact i think matthew said that his face was as the sun shining in his strength 
That's what Matthew says on the parallel passage. And that, by the way, matches what John saw on the Isle of Potmost. He said the exact same thing. Matthew, writing about the transfiguration, his sun was shining like the, his face was shining like the sun. John was on the Isle of Patmos. He said, he that I saw was to look upon, his face did shine like the sun with all of its strength. That's an awesome thing. It's like you have to shield your eyes. It's hard to see this. And also, not only that is clothing. It says there, if you go on, on in verse number 29, um, he says, his raiment became white and glistening. Mark puts this comment on. He says, his, it became so exceedingly white that you couldn't possibly, you couldn't take it to a laundry man and have it uh, bleached any whiter than what it was. It was just pure, absolutely pure, unimpeachable white. And that was the glory of the Lord that we see. Um, and the disciples, you know what, it, it says in verse 32, it's interesting, in verse 32, towards the end of the verse, it says, they, they were sleepy. That's one of the things the disciples were very good at, by the way, is sleeping when they ought to be praying. He took them up on this high mountain in order to pray with them, and he prayed, and they fell asleep. They, they were good at doing that. But when they awoke, look, at they awake and they see his glory. Sometimes I think the church today in the world is almost asleep to the glory of the Lord. But when he returns, there will be an awakening of all the world and they'll see that glory. But let's, let's actually trace this down a little bit. Turn, turn later in Luke to chapter 21. Later in Luke to chapter 21. And look at verse number 25. Okay, and this, this is um, Jesus Christ is speaking here. And he says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then they shall see, every eye shall see him, the Son of Man, coming in a cloud with power and with great glory. Now, when we were reading earlier in, in Peter, or back there in, in chapter 9, the, the, the comment was, in those days, they kept quiet about it. It was like, oh my goodness, what was this? What did we just see? And I suppose it didn't take them too long before they themselves figured out that, you know, we must be the, the, the ones that uh, got a preview, a sneak preview of the kingdom. Possibly they thought that, because... What they saw was inexplicable to them, and they, they never commented about it much in those early days. But later on, they did. And let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, and let's take a look at Peter's own commentary uh, on this matter. This is what we find that years later, the apostle Peter, who was one of the three guys on that mountain, beheld the transfiguration, the last, uh, um, you know, scripturally recorded thing that he wrote concerned in part that very event. And so we want to take a look at what he said it was all about. Um, so um, 2 Peter chap chapter 1 and verse number 16, he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you, look at it, the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. They heard this when they were swallowed up in that cloud. And he goes on, he says, And this voice which came from heaven 
we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And he makes it very clear, clear. He links it to the power and the coming again, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. At this point in time, Peter was way beyond. You know, he's like everybody. He's just like us. He's waiting for the king to return from earth because he's already ascended up on high. Um, and another hint. I don't know if you noticed it, but there were two Old Testament prophets that showed up there on the Mount of Transfiguration so that when Jesus was standing there, a couple other figures uh, appear beside him. And both of those figures actually point us to the second advent because both of those two figures actually participate in the second. They have an appointed role to play at the time of the second advent when Christ returns to earth. So to see that, go ahead and turn back to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. When Jesus Christ returns to earth, this is astonishing. He comes with power and great glory. Men on earth, kings, captains, they will fear, they will run, they will hide themselves and caves and mountains and they will cry out and say to the mountains and to the hills fall upon us and cover us and hide us from the face of the lamb for he is he's about to come and they eventually they wise up sometime before the end it's like the gig is up and they understand but here is a passage in malachi chapter 4 it refers to the second coming of christ he begins by talking a little bit about the character of his coming, what it's like. Notice in verse 1, he says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And notice this, And all the proud and all that do wickedly, they shall be a stubble. Right? They're just going to be all dried up. They're going to be fuel for the fire. Right? And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. It shall leave them neither root nor branch. But, and this is an important but, the same coming, although it burns up the stubble in the field, representing unbelievers, look what it does to others. But unto you that fear my name, the Son, capital S, of righteousness. There's that glory. There's that face that beams like the sun. Shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as the calves of the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked. And they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord. Now that right there is a second advent picture. And what's interesting about it is how the Old Testament ends. And this is why, you know, when they used to ask him, who do men say to Jesus? I said, who do men say to the am, that I am? And some of the, the guesses were, some people think you're Elijah. Or maybe you're that prophet, the one that was to be like Moses or Jeremiah. They would guess all these things. They would guess Moses and, and Elijah because these were two guys that they were expecting to be back on earth when the kingdom got set up. Now, they thought the kingdom was going to be set up in their day. And so they're looking for Elijah right there and right then. Where is he? If it's time for the kingdom to be set up, where's Elijah? And where did they get that? They get this from this passage. Look at verse number four. Remember you the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. And behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And they are there. They are the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. Moses, who represents the law. Elijah, who represents the prophets. Both the law and the prophets collectively pointing to a coming Christ, Messiah, the chosen one of God. And Jesus is that. And so these two fellows that are like there on the earth and play a role in ushering in his second coming, they, they appear there with him, and it's a kind of a signal to us. You know, another thing that they represent, Moses is one that, you know, he died and he was buried. The Lord buried him on Pisgah, Mount Pisgah. You know, there was some dispute about the, the body. You know, Jude talks about that, but he, he's, he's standing there and he's quite alive. 
with on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he was risen from the dead. And then Moses, in that sense, he's a type of all those people that at the second advent, when Jesus Christ comes again, you know he's going to raise a lot of people from the dead? He's got power to do that. That will be a manifestation of his power. That a lot of people that were dead hundreds and thousands of years ago, they're not dead anymore. They're alive and they're glorified. You know, Elijah, he never did die. He was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. He never died. So Elijah represents a second group that is also brought up at the second advent. And that would be those who happen to be alive and remaining on the earth. When Jesus Christ comes up, there's a whole bunch that are resurrected. Moses typifies them prophetically. There's a whole bunch that are translated through the rapture. Elijah typifies them. He too, he never died. And uh, all of those will happen at the second advent. When the, can you imagine? What will people say when all of a sudden here is a being that comes out of heaven with his face shining like the sun whose weapon is the word of his mouth. He doesn't mess around with nuclear bombs. That's, that's ridiculous. I mean, that, that has no power against him at all. He speaks, and his word is like a sword going out of his mouth that no one can overcome. And when he comes, angels are at his command, and, and people in glorified bodies do his bidding. There can be no doubt who he is. The tables turn so quickly. Can you imagine... I mean, if you can just put your, yourself in there. Right now, the, the people in the world, they run around, they, they mock Christians. They think that, you know, we don't have the truth, that we believe in pie in the sky by and by, and they will laugh at it. And how quickly, how profoundly everything will turn when at this moment, the reality of the truth that you now are walking in by faith, it's impossible to physically prove it to a person that doesn't want to believe it. It is possible to convince people that are willing to have a degree of respect in this word, and that's how we came to this knowledge, by respecting the word, by believing the word, until finally we were enlightened to the fact that there's a coming of the Lord, and when he does come, he will judge the living. Before him shall be gathered all the ethnicities of men, all nations, it says in the KJV, but that word for nations is ethnos. So what it really means is, does it matter if you're descended of Ham or Shem or Japheth, whether you live in Europe or Asia or Africa, you're going to all be gathered up, whatever you know, genealogical extraction you are from, and everyone will stand before the one man who is the second Adam and represents the only possible salvation for the entire human race. And he will have the power to judge them absolutely. And at that point in time, won't you be glad that you are a Christian? When you're standing there in a glorified body, a metamorphosis, but there's something else here. The glory that Jesus Christ never sought, and yet he gained in full measure, that glory is traceable, in a sense, to his sufferings that he endured at his first coming. Now, we kind of looked at that a little bit. If uh, I didn't read this part, but if you're back there in Luke chapter 9, and look at verse 20 through 22, he says to them in verse 20, Whom say you that I am? And Peter answering said, well, you're the Christ of God. And uh, Jesus acknowledges, okay, yeah, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, says in Matthew. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father revealed it to you. That's the truth of it. But then look what he says. He says, he immediately, he goes on verse 21, and he charged them and he said, don't tell any man this, not yet, because, verse 22, the Son of Man, the Messiah, must suffer. He must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised again on the third day. Now, the disciples were actually appalled at this idea of Jesus dying. You know, Peter says, that be far from thee, Lord. And when they were getting ready to arrest him in the garden, he yanks out his sword. No way, I'm not going to let them take you. Isn't it funny that when Moses and Elijah 
were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, they seemed to be a little bit more in the know. They actually were talking to Jesus, asking him about his decease, about his exodus, his departure that he was to accomplish there in Jerusalem. You know, they were connected prophetically to the second advent, but the thing of their interest was, you're getting ready to die? Their focus was on the first advent reality of him being offered up as a sacrifice. They knew that it had to happen, and that's what we find. Turn to later in Luke, to chapter 24. I'm just going to give you a couple of verses here, uh, some in Luke 24, and then I'm going to run over to Peter again, because Peter, having you know, experienced all this on the Mount of Transfiguration, he has some unique comments about the linkage between the glory and the suffering. But in Luke chapter 24, if you'll look there, please, look at verse 25. It says, he's, he's meeting these two, Cleopas and the other disciple, on the road to Emmaus, and he says, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not, Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And so right there in verse 26, he's suffering the ignominy of the cross. He's suffering there on Calvary, the shame and the spitting. And because he does that, in obedience to his father because he does that as our representative and to save our souls there's a glory that comes to him that is manifested his character is exposed as being the ultimate hero i mean we we, we do say that about people right that you know people that uh, first of all if they are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for some worthy cause be a a soldier or something like that we say well that, he's a hero there's a kind of maybe his maybe he dies he gave his life or something but let's not let's not forget his name because there should be a glory there he died in glory here's one that died in glory and rose again here's one that had so much glory because he he poured himself out to the utmost in order for others if you look later in in Luke chapter 24 um, verse 45 it will be then he opened their understandings that they might understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. He said it behooved me. It was something absolutely essential and called for. Now, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to jump to another passage of scripture. I'm going to have to jump ahead in my notes. But I, I, I'm running out of time, so I want to close with a final point here. And the final point that I'm going to close with is uh, simply this, that Christ's followers at his second coming, that in a limited sense, somehow in a limited sense, the glory that was manifested in him, he came up in a glorified state. You know, that is, in share, that is to an extent shareable with us. Now, there are some things that are true uniquely about Jesus Christ, so that he is ever and always the peerless son of God. But there is a sense in which he brings us into fellowship with us, him. He says, you follow me, you partake of my sufferings. And you know what happens? If you partake of my sufferings in this present life like I did, then in the life to come, you will also be a partaker of glory like as I. He, he says, as it happens to me. So if you be faithful in following me, you will find that to your level and to your degree as my followers, you will be honored by a reward based upon the same principle. And there's a reciprocity there. I think that we're going to find in heaven that those who have really sacrificed a lot and suffered greatly for the Lord Jesus Christ, when the time of standing before the judgment seat occurs, those people will be amply, amply compensated for all the great suffering and self-sacrifice in pouring out of, them, of themselves that they did in service to their king, he will say to them, well done. And he will recognize in full measure what they did and why they did it and reward them. And to see this clearly, turn please to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And let's once again, we're going to see here Peter again, 
And he's going to link the glory with the suffering. And he say that those things are, there's, there's kind of like a just reciprocity between them. That as you become partakers of the sufferings, so logically and in the justice of God, uh, you become partakers of a, of a consolation or a glory to follow. And in like measure, right? And he says this in verse, First Peter chapter four, and I think I'm going to begin reading at verse number twelve. Verse number twelve. Peter writes, he says, "Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you." But rejoice inasmuch as you are now, you're following Christ and you have become partakers of his sufferings. So that when his glory shall be revealed, when he has that metamorphosis, when all of a sudden he comes back from heaven with glory, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. For the spirit and the glory of God. Look at that. The spirit and the glory of God rests on you. On their part, the, the ones that are, you know, attacking you or assaulting you for, for your Christian stand. Yeah, on their part, Christ is evil spoken of. They're making fun of your, your, your faith in him, your religious stand for him. But as far as Christ is concerned, you are standing up for him, and it's a mark of glory that he will hold on your record. And he will, on the, the day of judgment, he will note that you were faithful to stand for him. Now listen, so there is a communication of glory. Now, let me say this. When, when the cloud of the glory that descended from the Father enveloped the mount, you know, the, what did the voice say? It, it, Mo, Peter had made kind of a blunder up there. He said, oh, let, let's build three tabernacles here. We'll, hey, we'll build one for you, Jesus. We'll build one for Moses and one for Elijah, too. Almost like he, it's almost like he was like trying to make a peer group out of them. Like, you guys are three prophets. There was a couple of Old Testament prophets, and now, you know, there's a New Testament prophet joined in with the... No, no, no. Moses and Elijah are not colleagues with Jesus Christ. We have to understand, yes... There is a sense in the overall plan of God where he's allowing mere men, Moses, Elijah, you, I, to maybe be partakers to an extent of glory. But the peerless one, the one that is an ineffable, eternal glory that emanates necessarily from his person, that is Jesus Christ and that is him alone. And, you know, this is a, to me, it's an encouragement to walk with him. I know that no man ever yet walked with Jesus Christ and came to regret it ultimately. Now, you might, you, you might suffer situationally, temporarily. You might find hardship in this life. You might sometimes be frustrated in this life. But if you stop and you pause and you think, how does it end? People, it ends beyond your wildest imagination. It ends well. It ends with no man able to regret anything that they all suffered. If there's any truth at all, I would almost suppose that when we get to heaven, we will have wished that back when we were on earth, we'd have been willing or able to somehow suffer even more for him than what we did. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful. For your love for us, I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would visit us now with your Holy Spirit as we, Lord, sing a, a hymn in closing. Lord, touch our hearts according to your own perfect will. We will give you the thanks and the praise for all you do in our lives, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.